Evening, everybody. This is Dr. Hack, and we are going to finish the Roy Lopez today. Uh, I'm excited about this. And then we're going to switch full on into the Carol Khan going forward. We're really going to get to know that opening intimately. Uh, in order to do this, we are going to play against an AI, actually. It was developed over at MIT. And uh, the guys that put her together, you know, if you can imagine them kind of assembling and giving her a nice haircut and, you know, putting her head on so it's not crooked and then giving her a bow tie or whatever, whatever you do to an AI. When they flipped the switch to, to make her sure she was turned on, she turned out to be evil, guys. She just wants to beat everybody at chess. Makes a good opponent, though. Okay. So we're playing against an AI. And she plays just like the amateurs on leechess.org, just like them. It's uncanny. Uh, and so when I saw this move, I thought, that's interesting. I wonder if people just do that because they're really worried about losing their pawn. And that could be the, tr the case. I don't know. But we know what to do when they play d6. We play c3 because we need a home for our bishop. And now she breaks the pin. Hmm. Now, this is a little bit different than what we've discussed, but I think the bishops here, they're okay to trade. We never really talked about that, right? Because this bishop is the bad one, technically. It's going to have trouble getting through this pawn, and this bishop is technically his good one or her good one. So we're very okay with that. I kept going forward, and then she did what every amateur always does in the, in the Roy Lopez. She chased our bishop away with both moves, a6 and b5. And now we have to choose whether we want the bishop on b3 or on c2. Well, what's the difference, right? Well, this one attacking a weak spot and this one defending a pawn. And the defending of the pawn, don't discount that too far. I'm going to do that in this one because I wanted you guys to see how cool it is to have that pawn defended. When this knight jumps into the game, we don't have to do something like rook to e1, which we normally would have to do, right? If we wanted to play the pawn through the middle. But we're just going to be able to play the pawn right through the middle early in this one. This is probably the earliest I've ever gotten in d4 in a game. I'll be honest. Okay. Oh, now I do want to show you something before we get any further into this. Um, because I want you to be able to trust the moves that we're seeing. And so um, I want to show you that we did in fact play a very nice game. They weren't all perfect moves. But they were very close, right? They were very good. And I had a really big inaccuracy on move 17 to 18. Okay. Um... And I'm sorry about that. But she didn't put any difficult puzzles in front of us. So we were actually able to do quite well uh, throughout the entire game. Okay. All right. So she did take the pawn, which kind of, kind of was nice. Because it allowed the knight to get to a better square if it wanted to. Right? And so I can come to c3 instead of d2, which is normally what happens in the Roy Lopez. <clears throat> and so I did. Okay, now you guys might find this next move a little bit weird because we did talk about this and we said, hey, maybe that move is not so good. Well, that was when, you know, if you remember, we had a bishop sitting here and we were kind of chasing it off. Well, this time there's no bishop sitting there. And the reason why I played this move was so that I could keep the bishop out of that square. I said, you know what? Look at where this bishop can go. Can't go here. We'll make a fork. Can't go here, obviously. And now it can't even go here. So what I've done is I've kind of made this kind of boa constrictory type opening idea where I've just restricted the black pieces and pushed them out of my side of the board and kept them out of there. This one too, it can't come there anymore. And so that's kind of why I did it. See, it's not a bad move. It's very useful sometimes. In this case, that's what I was doing with it. Okay. She plays h6 and I said, it's time. Let's go through the middle. Uh, what I'm really doing is I'm opening, opening up the attack on h7. That's what I'm staring at. And this removes the defender of h7 by making the knight move. And that was happy to me. Um, now, I didn't play this move lightly. I know you guys might be screaming at me and going, hey, what about this knight coming here? Yeah, what about it, right? I was worried about it. I was calculating it. I think this move right here took me 90 seconds to play. And this is only a 10-minute game. So that was a long one. And what I was thinking was, hey, I think this is the only move. After I, after I put it together, I said, can, can anything else happen here? Anything crazy? F5, maybe, you know, anything else. And I decided that the G6 move was forced in the end, which gave me a pawn at H6, if I was willing to give up my bishop for his knight. And we go back to our opening and we go, 
wait a minute, that wasn't okay. We never want to give up the bishop for the knight. Well, we only do it if we can get material for it. And in this case, I could, and so I did. Okay, now she could play knight to b4. Maybe she even should play knight to b4. But she moved to rook instead. Hmm. And now we have to figure out what to do. And I chose to go about it this way. I said, hey, look, there's a bishop on d7. I can keep the initiative going and attack it. Okay. And now we're probably going to end up trading some pieces off. But her queen's in, in danger, so the queen has to move first. And then I decided I would ch I would save the bishop for a minute. Okay. Maybe putting a pin on that. Well, what I was really looking at was I was looking at the, the pin here, and I was thinking to myself, maybe there's going to be some weakness on this pawn in a minute. You know, my knights are going to start hopping into the board through the center here, and they're going to start causing troubles for her. And that's really what I was looking at. She decided to trade off the bishops. Okay, gone, right? And so my knights started to come into the board. You can see the threat, knight to f6. She didn't handle the threat, and I won some more material. And now we're ahead a whole bunch, right? If you count it up, we're ahead by a whole rook. That's not accurate. We're ahead by an exchange. That's what I said. Did you guys, you guys didn't hear me right. Uh, and so I played, you know, here, something that I thought was very interesting. Because what I noticed was this bishop is trapped. You, you guys probably saw that too, right? All of you? Can't move anywhere. It's got no safe square. So g4 looks very tempting. But what I noticed was that this knight could actually hop in, chase the queen away, and then take this pawn with check. And then once the king moves, the bishop could just take the other pawn. I would lose two pawns trying to trap this bishop. And so I played queen to e3 to restrict that knight from coming down to both squares. And then I decided that the, the bishop was really in danger. She has to do something about it. And what she did was exactly nothing. And I said, sweet. Trapped bishop. Da -da. And now, now when you look at this, you'll notice that I'm up a full rook. Ha, I just jumped the gun before. Okay. And she goes queen to h8. And I thought to myself, well, well, how do you win a game when you're winning? You just get all the pieces off the board and try to make a queen out of a pawn. Done. Here we go. And then because she took, you know, back and I saw there might be an opening to the king, I said, hmm, I really wanted to play king to g2 because I was really worried about the queen just getting in and causing difficulty. But, you know, let's not worry so much, guys. Let's just go try to win. And so I did. And, and now the king went to the wrong square. If it had gone back to this one, um, maybe it would have been a couple of moves harder, right? But it didn't. It moved to this one, and now there's mate in two, which I was able to play. Check and then checkmate. Good game, Maya. So Maya goes down in game one. Let's go get game number two, and let's see some different ideas. All right, we're back for game two. And Maya is fuming, right? She is so tilted and angry because AIs get that way when you beat them. It's that badly, right? Um, and so she decides that this time she's going to make my, my D pawn move to D3. Smart girl, right? She's learning. They do that, these AIs. And then she decided she was going to go after me and get me, right? Here we come. And uh, we know what to do with this one. We, we've trained for this, you know? So we take the knight because we want to stay ahead in time. And the time that we get is specifically the bishop when these one of these pawns moves so it can get out. That's going to get us ahead by one more turn. And at the moment, we've got one piece in the game. We're about to get a second one in the game. So we're still ahead by a turn anyways because we're white. Okay. So here comes c6. It's a pretty weird looking move, but I think it's okay. And then b5. Hmm. Seems like everybody who's an amateur plays b5 at some point in this opening. Go figure. And then a5. She wants to trap the bishop. Now here's where I, I made a, an opening choice, right? Now I think there are multiple good moves here. And I think a4 would have been probably better, arguably, than what I played. Because the bishop could then stay on the, on the diagonal and keep attacking the weak square. Okay? But I chose to be consistent with our other ideas. And I went ahead and played c3 here. So that our bishop could hide on c2 when it needed to. Oh, and it needs to, right? It needs to. And so now she trades off the pawn. Most amateurs uh, don't like tension, right? So, so she wouldn't play a move like this one or like this one because she's 
not interested in holding the tension on the board. She wants to release the tension. She wants the pawn to be gone, so she doesn't have to, she doesn't have to think about it anymore. This is just typical, normal, normal behavior for, for a chess player. Okay, she goes d5. This is maybe the first sizable mistake. Okay, this is, this is something that I could tell it was a mistake very easily because the king is still in the middle and there's nothing on the e-file anymore. No things defending that king, right? So now when we give checks, that's gonna make it very hard for Maya. Now I thought I thought she should probably you know defend with this bishop so that she can get out of there. She chose this one first. Okay, right? And so what you do when you're trying to keep a king from castling is you put a whole bunch of pressure on this. And so I thought, what about this one? You know, what about the queen one? And I ended up going with the queen. And she didn't handle it very well at all. She castled. Now I get this move because I had to, I did a double take at first and I said, oh no. I thought she had gotten away with it. Because if I take the bishop, now the rook can step over and make a skewer for my queen to back row checkmate. And I almost stopped calculating there, but luckily I pushed myself a little bit harder. And I noticed that if I were to go up here after that move, I could actually capture the queen and that would be pinning the rook to the king and it wouldn't be allowed to take my rook, say checkmate, Whew, right? And so that's exactly what I did. I was able to win the whole piece because I saw that I could do it and I wasn't losing. Okay, and now we're up one whole piece, pretty good. So now in order to win a game when you're up material, it's okay to trade off. As a matter of fact, it's highly encouraged to trade off the pieces. And now we need to use our pieces. I see there's still a lot on the back row. I feel like that happens a lot in the Roy Lopez. And now we're developed, great. Okay. And I saw the, the next tactics on their way and I was concerned, right? I see that this, this rook is attacking my bishop, which is undefended. And I see that this pawn is, you know, attacked once and defended once. That is a weird arrow. And so I was concerned, you know, these things are weak. That's weak, that's weak, that's weak. And, and this rook is aimed at all of it, right? And so is the bishop. Yoikes. But I did notice that I could, for the moment, keep it together. And then she played d4, which is a great move. And I said, well, now what? I'm going to lose the c pawn no matter what every time. So what do you do when you're going to lose a pawn? You try to get something for it, right? And what can I get for it? Well, almost nothing. <laughs> but I can get some development, and that's what I used. I used the time to go get something instead of trying to push a bad idea. And now the knight has the move, so it does. And she traded off a piece. I was happy about that. My rook's in the game. She's having a hard time, you know, uh, leaving the back row because of the back row checkmates on her end. And now I'm threatening just to take this pawn because she can't get it back as, you know, stuff. And so when the checkmate threat came, I had lots of options, right? I could just do this and then give me a, give myself a place. Or what I could do is I could take the pawn, defend the back row checkmate, right? Offense and defense. And she decided that she was going to, you know, be feisty and try to try to attack me, which hung the back row checkmate and the game ended. Typical, typical kind of game. Okay. Good. Let's see one more. Okay, game three. And so you know how Maya, the other Maya, was was kind of tilted. Well, she went and got her bigger sister, and this is now Maya 9, okay? And Maya 9 is rated in the 1700s, 1728. She's a little bit stronger of a player, but not by much. You know, Maya 5, Maya 1, they were both in the 1600s. So let's take a look at the computer analysis real quick so we know if we can trust the moves or not. And uh, I saw this beforehand. I was pretty happy with this. I played a perfect game. 98%. She didn't put any puzzles in front of us that we couldn't solve in this game. That's what that means. Um, so I was super happy. And that means we can trust all the moves that we see. Don't even question them at all, right? We just know it was right. But these moves all make sense too, which is kind of cool. Um, so she attacks the pawn again. We defend the pawn. 
right? She plays bishop to c5. This is new. We haven't seen this yet in these games. So now she's attacking f2 a couple of times, and we can expect maybe even to see this knight pop down here to attack it later. We'll see if that happens or not. I went ahead and castled. I don't need to play c3 yet until she plays pawn to d6, and now I do have to play c3. Remember, we just need to save our bishop. Okay. And in this one, I chose to go ahead and try to play through the middle. Now, this move does carry a little bit more uh, power to it because it will be attacking a bishop when it, when it comes. But I can't just do it, right? I can't just do it because this pawn needs some help. Um, and so I went ahead and played rook e1 first. This is pretty normal. Now, if the knight were to jump in, I think what I would do is I would defend the pawn from the side here. And remember, if he if, if she trades off the knight and the bishop for the rook and the pawn, it's six points for six points, but we get the better end of the deal. So we're okay with that, right? It's the same mistake we made in the middle game, the idea that didn't work. Okay, so she pins the knight. And remember me, personally, I'm super happy when they do that because when you put a bishop on this square and you know the knight is safe because you've already played c3, well, that means the knight can't sit on the square too. So now, I'm, now f2's happy, right? So I was actually a little bit excited. I said, you know, that's good for me. It has to be good for me. But at the same time, I hate leaving that pin there for a long term. I don't want to leave it there, right? I know it's not in danger. I know it's five moves away for the danger to get there. And she is going to do that, which is incredible. This is awesome, guys. Okay, so we got to bring the knight around to g3 so that we can push the h pawn and make the bishop run away. She can't go that way because the knight will get her, okay? So she goes a6, which we expect from all amateurs, and b5, which we expect from all amateurs. Okay, and I did go down to, to c2. This time I chose this c2 move because from b3, the king is already castled and there's no weak spot at f7. And so I decided the bishop was better here so that it would help when I pushed the deep on. <clears throat> That's why it went to c2 this time. Different reason, same move. Here comes the knight. Do you remember this when we studied this? The knight's going to wrap all the way around down to this square. And then if we give enough time, this knight will move and the queen will even come in to attack this a third time. I don't know if you remember that. That's what's going to happen here. And so I started to, to remove the bishop. And guess what? I ran out of time, guys. <laughs> the knight made it to h4. But, you know, that's okay because that's only the second piece attacking f3. Not the third piece, just the second piece. Okay, and so I went ahead and, and started to push through the middle because an attack on the wing is countered by an attack through the middle. Hmm. Okay, and then she went ahead and, and messed up my pawn structure around my king. You got to expect that, right? Okay, so the question that we have to ask is before we take this piece, because we're going to take the piece if it's, if it's okay, is are we going to get checkmated if we take that piece? So what I'm really concerned about is whether or not a queen can arrive here before my bishop arrives here. And my bishop is so close to being able to do that that how could this not be worth a full piece right now? You know, it didn't take too long of a calculation. This might have only been 15 or 20 seconds before I said, there's no way she's getting there, dude. And I said, take the bishop, gone. And then because she allowed me to trade queens, now I really can't get checkmated. You know, and now I'm just like, okay, we're just up a whole piece. Great. And when you're up a whole piece, how do you how do you finish the game off? You start to trade the pieces off the board that you can trade. Rooks, maybe a minor piece or two. And then when you have the most pieces left on the board in the end game, you, you queen a pawn and you win the game. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this game. That's the process. Okay. So I want to trade off as many pieces as I can. Here we go. And she decided she wanted to trade off as many pieces as she could, which is weird, right? That's very weird. Um, now, if I take the knight, she won't be able to play this one because this rook will hang, right? So, so I, was, I was worried about the rook getting here and starting to make trouble for my, my f3 pawn. But she can't do that, so now I've messed up her pawn structure the same way she did to mine. Aha, return to cinder, that tactic, right? So now we can trade off all the rooks, as many as we can. And so we do. Because we have an extra piece, and an extra piece is worth all the trades you can manage. Um, this tactic that I'm about to play is, I think, I think I call it a typical endgame tactic, but I also know that there's no such thing as typical endgame tactics because you, you don't see endgames often enough as amateurs to know 
there are normal things to do. And so I was able to start to move these pawns onto black squares, which was my goal, because I want to get them off of the color of the bishop that he can attack. And I want to get them off the color of my bishop so that I can move my bishop around more freely. And I was able to do that with tactic here, because if she takes the pawn, which she did, then there's a fork of the two pawns and I'll get it back right away. Okay, no waiting, no must, no fuss. So this is okay when you can get the piece back right away. It's easy to see, just go do. If it's a longer term thing where you've just got tripled pawns and you're gonna to try to win them, that also wins pretty often. It works pretty often, you know? So you don't have to think about those too hard when, they're, when the pawn structure is this bad. Um, she saved the F pawn. Uh, and what I was looking at was, hey, I would really like this king to get into the game. I would like him to go this way. Um, and I need this bishop to move. So I really considered coming back and just chasing it off so that I could move the pawn up and the king could get active. Because in the end game, the king is worth, you know, four points as an attacking piece, as long as he can't get checkmated. So if, if her king gets in the game and starts doing stuff and my king stays back here, she's actually going to be ahead in material localized somewhere in the middle of the board. Hmm, we can't let that happen. We have to have an active king. But I went ahead and took the pawn because I saw that I had enough time maybe to get back. Especially if she tries to move the king up, I can give a check in one of these two squares and do it very quickly. And she did. And I did. Now the bishop has to move, and it does. So the pawn can move. This also has a, a lovely, lovely side effect. Um, which is that the, I just built a wall that the king can't cross. You see that? She has to go back this way to get in. So that makes the king take a little bit longer. So while she's doing that, my king can enter the game. Okay. And now since I've got a king attacking this piece, that's one attacker. I only need one more, which is very easy to get, right? And so we do, and so we do. And now we're just winning pawns. And since we're the one, only one with a piece left in this game, we should win this game quite easily, right? The guy with the last piece left is just golden. And so we're just going to continue to to push forward into this. Um, I needed her king to move. Uh, sometimes in, in the end game, your king just gets stuck because there's a relationship between the kings where if one's sitting there, you just can't go forward, right? You're stuck. So I needed her to go, well, not that way. I needed her to go one way or the other so my king can get in and help the pawn start moving again. But she's in my way. And so all I have to do is make sure she doesn't have any more moves. And so I took away all of her moves left. If she moves that one, I'll take it. If she moves this one, I'll move over and take it, right? Perfect. And so now my pawn starts moving. And I thought to myself, how do I win this pawn? I was really worried about my knight. And then I bonked myself on the head and said, you dolph. All you have to do is move your king away. If he takes, if she takes the knight, you're going to make the queen because your pawn's faster than her king. Well, they're the same speed, really, technically. Um, but she'll be behind the pawn in the race. So I just moved away. She took the knight. Oops, and now the pawn can beat her to the end of the board. And as I queened, I went ahead and resigned the game. So she technically won this one. Good job, Maya. Um, but I didn't want to play the queen end game. You guys, you guys have seen those. You know what those are all about. Uh, so that's all I've got for now. I hope you guys can go and just absolutely crush people with this opening. It's such a good one. Okay. If you have questions, put them in the comments. Come back, right? I'll be happy to answer them and help you guys out. And uh, yeah, you guys have a good one. Take care. Bye now.